All right. So pumped today to have a very special guest, another physician like myself, who's also a scientist and really has done a lot of great work with food. Food is medicine is kind of his mantra. He wrote the amazing book, Eat to Beat Disease, several years ago. He's followed that up with, I think, even a better book now that's called Eat to Beat Your Diet, because ah, I think diet's kind of a bad word. In my, in my mind, it is one of those four-letter words, because so much negative connotations with diet. Heck, it has the word die in it. But we got Dr. William Lee on the podcast today. So grateful to have him. How are you, Dr. Lee? I'm doing very well, Dr. Hemingway. It's great to be on with you. Oh my gosh, the pleasure is mine, as they say. So pumped to have you. I would love for you to share a little bit about the transition of writing your first uh, big best-selling book, Eat to Beat Disease, to how you decided to write this new book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, and kind of what's the origin story of that? Yeah, well, my latest book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, is really a sequel to my first book, Eat to Beat Disease. And that first book was, uh, you know, really trying to define what it is that um, keeps us healthy. In other words, why don't we get disease more often? Because people are always wondering, why did I get diabetes or why did I get cancer? Why did I actually um, develop heart disease? You know, those are the things that you and I are trained to help patients think through, diagnose and treat. But actually a more interesting research question is how come we don't all get sick more often? And that led me in my first book to describe to readers the fact that the body actually has its own hardwired health defense systems that really are uh, baked into our bodies from the time we were born. We formed in the womb. We're born with these health defenses. And in fact, they serve us well throughout our entire life, which is why we don't get the, the sick more often. Now we do get sick. And so that first book was about, well, okay, why do we get sick when our defenses go down? And then what can we do to actually shore up our defenses so that our shields are up for longer periods of time? Or if we actually get sick, how do we actually um, get the shields back up? So that was my first book. And, and um, in my second book, um, Eat to Beat, um, not disease, but your diet, it really, you know, when you and I, before we started the, this recording, talked a little bit about the, 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 the bane of existence that I think a lot of patients walk around with and a lot of people walk around with, which is, you know, they're, they're struggling, they're wearing the backpack of having to go place to place, month to month, uh, year after year, uh, trying different types of diets um, uh, to, you know, with the idea of maybe, maybe losing some weight because their doctor told them to, or maybe losing some weight because they want to, maybe they have to get ready for a wedding or an event, or they want to get their beach body back, or they're middle aged and they're just struggling with changing body shape and they feel like they should do something to get themselves into better shape. Well, what I realized is that to get to your next level of health beyond simply raising your shields with their health defenses, one of the things that we all should do as we, as we go through this journey of life called health is really improve our metabolism. And metabolism is a much more profound way of thinking about health than simply losing weight or going on a diet. And so for me, as a researcher, um, I'm a vascular biologist, I study blood vessels, and also for me as an, as an internal medicine doc. So it means I take care of men and women, young and old, healthy and sick. What I was really interested in doing is um, unpacking this mystery called metabolism that everyone thinks they know something about. But in fact, science, new science has radically and just recently radically changed pretty much everything we know about metabolism. And in fact, most of the ideas that we've had are now upended. For example, um, most of us think that people are born with different metabolisms, either a slow metabolism or a fast metabolism, but whether based on whether or not you've been struggling with food and weight your whole life. Or number two, that if you actually um, uh, hit your middle ages, 40, 45, 50, your metabolism automatically slows down. And what a bummer that is. And so what do you actually do about it? And the third thing is that is a third gigantic idea that happens not to be true is, you know, the, the fact that I used to think about this myself is that, you know, a slow metabolism causes you to gain weight. And so therefore, you know, it's one of those things where some people are blessed with a fast metabolism and others are cursed with a slower metabolism. And that's what they got to deal with. What turns out, and this is what I really, this is the beating heart of my new book is that 
Our metabolism isn't what we thought it was. And the new science actually says that we have the power to be able to help elevate and resurrect the metabolism, our metabolism to what it is that it was designed to actually do in our body. And there's foods that can actually do that as well. Yeah, no, that's uh, just, I think you and I, when we did our training, we had no idea about this. And I think you're maybe alluding to a recent uh, research article that showed that basically in our adult years, right, between the ages of 20 and 60 is kind of the rough range there that our metabolism doesn't effectively slow down at all. <laughs> and so we can't just blame. I know I kind of did for about a decade ago when I turned 40, I kind of said, ah, something's not quite right. Maybe I'm not, you know, uh, as optimally, you know, in health and shape as I thought, but I was still eating well. I was still exercising. And I thought, oh, it just must be my age, right? It just automatically your metabolism goes down. I think many of us have been taught that. And the new science, like you say, does not actually show that, that our metabolism basically does stay pretty rock stable in our adult years between 20 and 60. And even after that, it doesn't slow significantly. It slows a little, but but not, we can't just blame our metabolism. So so tell us a little bit about that. So what is to blame? How do we get a fast or slow metabolism? How does that yeah. work? Well, look, let, let's first kind of um, go back to basics because yeah. You know, when you and I were training in medical school, we were taught pretty much the Wikipedia definition of metabolism, right? Metabolism is the sum of all chemical reactions in the body to create energy using ATP and blah, 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 blah. Things that actually, you know, going all the way decades back would make my eyes glaze over. And, and I don't know about you, but, you know, it, it doesn't actually, um, that def those definitions may be true to some extent, but they don't actually tell you what to do. And so when we're actually talking to patients or really looking in the mirror and thinking about ourselves. And I think anybody watching or listening to this will uh, relate to this, you know, so uh, based on what you're saying about metabolism, what am I supposed to do? And the, what am I supposed to do really, I think can be uh, more easily understood by an easier, kinder, gentler, more pragmatic way to think about metabolism. So here's how I have now been thinking about it and teaching people about it, which is that, look, metabolism is simply uh, the program that our body uses. It's hardwired into our body in order to be able to take food that actually contains the energy that we need and convert that energy once we eat uh, to, into fuel. And that fuel gets stored into our body. And then our body is able to use that fuel uh, to power up the engine, now, our engine being our cells and our organs. So whether we're actually going to work, doing the laundry, going for, uh, you know, training for a marathon, it's all the same. M metabolism, simply put, is really food, at, you know, taking the fuel, storing it, and putting it into our, into, uh, to putting it to use. Very similar, by the way, to how if you have a car and you're driving um, a gas car still, basically, we sit and drive uh, from point A to point B without thinking about how the fuel is stored and taken through into the engine of the car to power the pistons uh, so that we can actually get through. However, we do think about our our uh, engine and the gasoline um, a couple of times. Uh, uh, once when we have a problem, we actually think a lot about it, but, but also we think about it more regularly when the fuel tank runs low, runs towards empty, all of a sudden, we're thinking about the gas for the first time in a long time. And what do we do? We pull over to the filling station and put that nozzle into the gas tank and fill up the tank, right? When the tank is full, the, the, the meter goes up to the top and that's it. Put the nozzle back and we're off to the races again, right? Our metabolism is very similar to that, actually. And instead of going to the gas station when our tank is running towards empty, um, our brain and our organs signal to our body, hey, you know what? Time to fill up. And we pull over to the dinner table or to the restaurant or to the refrigerator, or to the pantry, where we get, we fill up with fuel, which is food. And that's, I think, a much easier way to think about it. Now, one of the things that is really remarkable about our metabolism that I discovered and write about my book is how dependent our metabolism, in other words, our energy levels are, to um, a healthy amount of body fat, meaning fat is actually critical for us to have a good metabolism. Just the opposite of what most people think, right? Most people think, oh, I don't want any fat at all. I want to have, I want to be as lean as possible. I want to have the minimal amount of body fat and, and that's how I'm going to be better. I'm going to be healthier that way. Wrong. Actually, it turns out that we all need a certain amount of body fat 
in order for us to be healthy. And here's how it works. Basically, as adults, our relationship to body fat and thinking about metabolism is pretty skewed towards negativity, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm sure, uh, Dr. Hemo, you and I have shared this as well as anybody watching this. You step out of the shower in the mirror, you're drying off and out of the corner of your eye, you see the mirror and you see a lump or a bump. I don't care what your body type is. You know, you could be pretty lean, but you still see it. Something that doesn't belong there and makes you unhappy. So then you curse like, man, I need to get in better shape. I got to be eating a little bit better now. Then you step on the scale. That number isn't exactly the number you were expecting or hoping for. You curse again, right? And then if you're in a grocery store shopping, you could be shopping anywhere. It could be middle America. It could be in the tropics. You're pushing that carpet shopping cart around. If you, if you're even if you're a vegan, you got to go roll by the meat section and you see a steak with a big rind of fat. Like immediately, your mind goes, "Oh my god! I hope nobody eats that. That's disgusting." Right. So as adults, our relationship, our, our, our association with body fat is very, very negative. However, there is a time where we where fat makes us smile and we feel good. And that's when we actually see babies, because think about it. When you see a newborn or you see you know, an infant, the thing that makes us grin and smile ear to ear is a big, fat baby, big, chubby tummy, big, fat cheeks arms and legs that look like balloons that the circus clown twisted into a poodle, you know, um, that makes us smile. And so somewhere in our kind of primitive brain, we actually intuitively know that fat can't be all bad. So here's what the biology says. Fat has four functions that are absolutely critical, actually five. I'll go quickly through them. And, and they, they all are, it, it all actually matters to our health. And the reason I'm saying this is because before we curse body fat, we need to understand why what it actually does for us that's good that we want. Number one, fat is a is padding. Okay, it's like packing peanuts uh, uh, in a in a shipping box. Thank goodness we have padding because if we didn't have any body fat of any sort, if we tripped on a rug and fell on the floor, some of our more delicate organs might split open. Your ER doc, you know, you've probably seen plenty of that 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 trauma that can actually occur. Thank goodness we've got some padding. Number two, our body fat, which starts out in life associated with our blood vessels. So right where our circulation is, body fat builds around it. It turns out that um, our body fat or fat cells, adip uh, adipose cells is what they, we call them, actually are the fuel tanks. The same way that we our car has a fuel tank that you put the nozzle in to fill up for the gas, our fat cells has, a, have a, has another function, which is it's a fuel tank. Unlike a car tank, which is rigid and made out of steel, fat cells can stretch. And that's why we our fat can get bigger. So when we're filling up with fuel, a tiny little fat cell will expand up to three times its size, blows up like a water balloon, all right? And so that's really important, by the way, that filling up with the fuel, because when we're eating, it fills it up. But when we're not eating, all right? And I'm just talking about sleeping. I'm talking about, you know, between meals. Uh, what happens is that our body relies on that stored fuel to burn it down. So we've got the energy. I don't know why they didn't teach us this in medical school this way. It's so much easier to understand. All right. The third thing that's really amazing about um, fat is, is that fat's an actual organ in the body. These days, we actually classify fat as an endocrine organ. Endocrine meaning it makes hormones. There's 15 hormones that fat has been discovered to secrete. Three of them actually are necessary for our metabolism, necessary for our metabolism. One is called leptin. Some people might think of that as a satiety hormone, meaning it makes you feel full. So kind of like the right way to think about it. It's actually more of a, a dimmer switch on your light, okay? And, and it's actually connected to the fuel tank, so like, like in your car. So when the leptin switch is low, the lights are dim, it's kind of like your gas gauge reading low. Hey, you know what? You got to fill up. So you go over to the dinner table to start filling up, all right? When the lights bright switch is on, fuel tank is, is full, all right, I'm not so hungry anymore. Let's st step back, step away from the table, all right? And that's really how it works. It's more of a, of, a, of a functional switch that varies over time. Hey, listen, if we, didn't, if we didn't have that gauge, we wouldn't know when to fill up our tank or not, all right? So very important to even have any energy at all. Um, number two, another or, uh, a hormone is called adiponectin. 
adiponectin, part of the name uh, is connected to the fat tissue is coming from ad adipose uh, cells. But here's the amazing thing about what adiponectin does. It is um, a hormone that is 1,000 times higher in its concentration in your blood than any other organ, uh, any other hormone, higher than thyroid hormone, higher than estrogen, testosterone, higher than cortisol. So, and the amazing thing is why is it so high? It's because a, a diponectin made by our healthy body fat cooperates with insulin so that the efficiency of drawing in fuel into our cells to power up our engine is as efficient as possible. The more diponectin you have, the more efficient your metabolism is. All right, so we need that. Our fat actually fuels that up. And then another hormone is called resistant. And if a diponectin is the, the gas pedal, the accelerator, resistance is the brake. It's, it's like getting into the fast lane. Oops, the truck's ahead. Slow down a little bit. So we can actually get, we can actually jockey back and forth in terms of our metabolism. And these, this is actually healthy fat will do this. The fourth thing is that fat, surprisingly, um, uh, there's a special kind of fat that can actually fight too much fat. It's called brown fat. It's a space heater and it fires up. And then the fifth role of, of fat, healthy fat tissue, it's actually, um, a, um, uh, it's actually a parking lot for about 15% of our immune system. So our immune system hangs out um, uh, it's kind of like the bleachers, uh, for, uh, our immune cells. They're just hanging out there. And so long as our fat is healthy, it'll actually, um, uh, all these functions are working on our behalf to support our health. And by the way, this is why, partly why, why I wrote this book is to say after our basic health, how do we take things to this next level? And it turns out that healthy body fat is connected to a healthy metabolism and the things that we used to fear we used to vilify fat no we want to actually respect our fat and in fact we don't want to cut it out suck it out burn it or poison it all bad ideas we actually want to tame our fat and and one way we can actually do it surprisingly is to eat foods that can help our uh, help fight fat yeah now so important to to really see the, the actual function of fat in our body. We need it. It's one of the first things embryologically that develops, right? Right after the blood vessels, the fat gets uh, laid down there. And it is our entire life so vital to optimal functioning that we have these uh, or this functionality, as you just described, in the fat. So what, what goes wrong, Dr. Lee? How does our fat become diseased? How does it yeah. get really inflammatory? Like what, what, where, where can we make the sort of steps to kind of right. curtail this, this, uh, this diseased fat in our bodies and how do we heal it? How do we tame yeah. it? Yeah. Well, look, I want to walk on both sides of this yeah. equation. So you can actually figure, we can look at, look at, look at um, extremes on both sides that are all unhealthy. First, let's talk about when you cut down your body fat to way low levels. I mean, you know, bodybuilders that look amazing on the stage, you know, you take photographs and the judges are looking at these okay. sinewy, well-defined, you know, men and women. Um, uh, that's amazing, but they all have 5% body fat, 3% body fat. I mean, extraordinarily low body fat. Well, you know what? When you don't have enough body fat, forget about the padding aspect. That's bad enough. Yeah. But your hormones aren't being treated. Those fat hormones are leptin, the redipinectin resistant. And so you can't draw in your energy. So you can't, your, your, your energy levels actually go down. And, and this is why ultra low levels of body fat for, for bodybuilding competitions, for example, you can't sustain it. That it's like, like bodybuilders will actually go into a crisis, metabolic crisis, and it can actually be fatal. So this is one extreme. And by the way, I'll let's take this extreme even further. You know, um, Tom Hanks in a uh, castaway on an Island. All right. If he didn't find any of those coconuts or crabs to eat, guarantee you, he would continue to lose body fat. If you're shipwrecked on an Island with no food, you will continue to Go down on your body fat, your, your body, your metabolism um, uh, uses every bit of energy that's stored in those fuel tanks until there's nothing left and then you die. Okay. So those are extremes. Um, that's why you need to have some healthy ish amount of body fat. Now let's go to the other extreme. And this is what we were seeing as really a true pandemic actually um, that hasn't gone away. Uh, in many developed countries, which is we have overage of body fat. Now, how do we actually gain more body fat? Simple. Remember I told you that, you know, when your um, fuel gauge is low, you, know, you need more energy, 
uh, 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 your the, the low leptin sends a signal to your brain, hey, pull over, buddy, and let's go get some food, fuel, and let's load up so we have energy. Well, let's say if you load up an energy um, and you're eating three reasonable size meals a day that are of healthy and balanced, you're going to fill up your tank and you're going to be able to you know, rinse and repeat and do that again the next day. But we now live in a society of abundance where there's no limit on the amount of food we can eat. And there are choices, more bad choices, more harmful choices than, are, than there are good choices. So it's very easy to be distracted in terms of what we actually look for when we want to eat. And, you know, the very clever marketing and food engineering that makes, you know, those fluorescent covered colored chips that <laughs> taste amazing because they evoke our childhood you know eating junky food like you just reach for that grab of that bag of whatever okay i mean you, you fill in the blank you, you everyone can actually choose some junk food that they love all right and you start eating that look that's way that goes way more beyond filling the gas tank and now not only are we actually filling the gas tank over and over and over and overflowing it. So look, in a car, there's only one gas tank. And when that tank is uh, filled, the nozzle goes click, no more gas. In our body, we don't, it's, it's first of all, it's, it's flexible, so it can expand. Number two, there's no clicker, okay? So what happens is that you can fill it up. You fill up a fat, okay, full of fuel, still, wanna, still hungry, you're going to still eat some more. All right, now you just go to the next fat cell and fill that one up too. Oh, we're still eating? Let's fill up another one. Oh, we ran out of fat cells now. Guess what? Our body is very resourceful, can pull out stem cells from our fat. There's stem cells into our fat, kind of a reserve, like the National Guard of our fat, to actually make new fat cells. So when, we're, when we keep on eating, our body will just make more fat cells, blow those up. Oh, still more? Bring it on. Let's make some more. And you can kind of see how over and over, the more we eat, the more we overeat. And this is not just one time at a meal. I'm not talking about having seconds and thirds. Okay, although that matters as well. I'm talking about day in and day out, week after week, year after year, a lifetime from teenage years all the way to adult years of overindulging, eating food. And by the way, the food isn't high quality fuel anymore. If you're eating a lot of junky food, you're at the gas station, right? And you're filling up your tank with your car. What if you consistently chose the cheapest, poorest quality gas, and you just filled up your car with the with the crappiest gas you can find? You know, you might do that once in a while. Not going to hurt your car. But if your entire existence of your car, you're only filling it up with the poor, cheap fuel, guarantee you it's not going to last as long as somebody who takes the time to actually uh, and puts the investment in for high quality fuel over time, that car is going to last a lot longer than the one that's got crappy fuel. So back to the analogy of the human overeating crappy fuel, okay, crappy food, junky food that not only overloads our fat and grows it bigger and bigger, but also damages the other body defenses because of artificial preservatives and artificial coloring, artificial flavorings, okay, all these additives, okay, um, and, and change properties, microplastics, all kinds of other things we're loading into our body. It's going to gum up our tank and actually screw with our metabolism. Now, now we're actually getting towards this chronic disease because we've got a mound of fat much bigger than it needs to be. Guarantee you, you cannot actually just overnight sleep off that amount of fuel you have just accumulated, okay? Now, what happens is that you will burn it down over, over time, but if you keep on overeating, take uh, you know one step forward, two steps back, you're going to keep on gaining it. And here's the problem. When our healthy fat that normally keeps us alive and keeps gives us energy outgrow, gets so big it outgrows its blood supply, okay, what happens is that the mass outgrows its blood supply. It's an organ, like needs blood supply. What happens is that in the middle of that fat mass, it starts to actually die. It's called hypoxia. Can't get enough air, all right? Um, it's like a heart attack of your fat, all right? And what winds up happening is that any tissue that becomes hypoxic or starts to become oxygen starved, inflammation sets in right away, all right? It's kind of a defense uh, maneuver, but big, big honking fat, uh, dying in the middle, oxygen starved, inflammation sets in. Now you've got a big mass of inflammation. And when this happens, I'm not talking about your double chin or your under your arm or your, or your, um, your muffin top. I'm talking about inside the tube of your belly. 
This is called white fat, visceral fat's another word for it, gut fat, wrapped all around your organs. You've got this big choking mound of, of fat strangling your organs and filled with inflammation, leaking out, seeping out everywhere. It's pretty easy to understand while overeating, poor quality fuel uh, over an amount of time leads to excessive, harmful, inflammatory body fat that sets you up, sets us up for every chronic disease you can imagine. Cardiovascular disease, um, uh, uh, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, cancer. Um, we even believe, besides obesity, that this is also one of the fundamental uh, 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 roots that actually could lead to dementia later on as well. Uh, and other types of neurodegeneration is, you know, this excessive inflammatory state. But here's the thing, body fat, remember, is actually normally really healthy. So the power is in our control to be able to yoke it back, you know, um, and, and try to bring it under, bring it, get it back into shape so we can actually remove some of that inflammatory mess. Yeah, no, I'm glad you mentioned that, especially the the point about the visceral fat, which is kind of if you want to fate, uh, if you want to hate a type of fat, hate the vis visceral fat. That's the stuff that you don't want. In fact, would even you... people that that are thin that that have excess visceral fat, they can look quote unquote look healthy, right? The so called skinny but not healthy, you know, people out there that they may not even know that they have this highly inflammatory fat hidden in their insides around their wrapped around their organs. And you and I have seen this, whether it be when we did our dissections in medical school, did our general surgery rotation, when you have your organs enveloped with fat, this is not a good thing. And it is very diseased inflammatory fat and you can be skinny and not healthy. And so paying attention to visceral fat is super important. Um, what were you going to say about the visceral oh, fat? I, I, I was just going to say there was a study done of women, this is out of uh, uh, Cornell Weill Medical Center, where they looked at almost three, they looked at more than 3,000 women who actually uh, were not obviously overweight, not obese. They actually looked normal, too thin. Um, and, the, and they were like normal body mass index, as they say. Um, uh, and they studied them for 13 years and they measured the amount of visceral fat that these uh, women had. Now, some women had very little and some women had a lot and they followed them over time and they measured their blood tests over 13 years, all women uh, uh, over time. And they measured who actually had breast cancer. And it turns out the women who had the, with, had the highest amount of skinny fat, visceral fat, remember these are all women, these look pretty normal body shape size, um, those women who had the highest amount of visceral fat that could not be seen by the naked eye, all right, um, had twofold increase in the risk of developing invasive estrogen positive breast cancer. So it just goes to show you, and, and their fat hormones were all over the map, um, uh, and they had huge amounts of inflammatory markers. So we see this, this is not a theory, this is a fact. And so, you know, for anyone who's watching this saying, ah, you know what? I don't listen to metabolism things. I never got on a diet in my whole life. This, what we're talking about, Dr. Hemingway, is not about a diet. I mean, you and I both talked about this idea of it. Like we believe in anti-diets because look away from the diet. Think about inner health and taming body fat is a very important part of inner health. Yeah, so so important. And I think, like you said, the the real root of, every disease out there is inflammation. And that visceral fat is highly inflammatory. And basically every disease we know about from the number one killer, which is heart disease, to the cancer, to the uh, even diabetes and obesity can be a very uh, inflammatory state. And so in your book, which I, I love your new book because it gives us so many ideas of not only what kinds of foods can be really helpful, but you even have recipes in there. In fact, one of them that I, I noted last night, I was just thumbing through some recipes and it was one of the simplest things you'd ever seen. And it was basically watermelon with chili pepper, salt, and lime. And I've always eaten fruit with uh, salt and, and a little bit of spice too, uh, especially uh, people that don't know this, if they have a real sweet fruit, like for example, in Hawaii, we have a lot of pineapple. If you sprinkle a little chili pepper on that, a little bit of salt, it's insane. Your taste buds are like exploding Whoa. with flavor. <laughs> and what I love about your new book is you have so many ideas of not only the types of foods, I forget how many hundred you list that are helpful, 
but also you have actual recipes in there that we can go to. Because I think too often we think about, oh, somebody's talking about food. They're just going to tell me all the stuff I can't eat. Like nobody wants to. In fact, that's why diets don't work, right? They deprive us. They tell us, oh, we can't eat this. We can't eat that. And yet you have the additive. These are all of the things you could consider adding to your diet. And I'm sure you know this, but there are literally like 200 plus thousand edible, you know, vegetables, fruits, foods out there that are great for us. And we as humans on average eat less than 200 and three or four of them make up 60% of our calories. It's crazy. Like we need to broaden our palate. And so maybe speak to that a little bit and some of your favorite helpful foods, which may have this effect to to help tame the fat or even burn fat and kind of, you know, some of your, your pearls on the food part and what, what you love sure. on, on, on doing sure. that. Well, look, uh, first of all, I'm glad you mentioned the recipes because I wrote the book as a foodie. I, I actually really, really enjoy uh, exploring new tastes and, 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 and just delighting myself. Uh, whenever I'm traveling and I arrive in a new town, one of the things I'm really curious about is like, I go to the market, the local markets, uh, if, if they have a fresh market, and I see what are they actually selling there and what do the people around wherever I am, what are they actually eating locally, seasonally, regionally? Um, those things really interest me. And I also like to cook. And so, you know, I hope anyone who's reading the book can feel the fact that I'm very authentic about my passion for food. And, and this is also part of anti-diet, which is, you know, if you're all about diets, like you, you know, it's... Fear, shame, guilt, elimination, deprivation, restriction. I'm all about what can you lean into your food to enjoy your life? Because if you can align your uh, pleasure of eating with your desire for health, like that's the perfect alignment of the stars. So a couple of things. First of all, I wrote about 150 different foods in this book um, uh, in the middle section. And I talked to you about each of the foods uh, uh, as if, as an author, I was typing uh, as if you were sitting in the grocery cart, my grocery cart, and I was pushing you through it the way that your mom pushed you through the grocery cart when you were a kid and you were riding her. But this time, what I do is I whisper in your ear, what are the things in the produce section, in the middle aisles, in the beverage section, in the seafood section, you should pull off and, and stick into the cart that help your metabolism. And the reason that foods can help your metabolism, um, now remember, let, let's, make, let's be really clear about this. Uh, just a little, a few minutes ago, we were talking about don't overeat. So of course, even healthy food, you don't want to overeat. But it turns out that there are some foods you can find in almost every section of the grocery store, where when you eat them, surprisingly, they activate our body's reactions, our hardwired system, our metabolism, to turn on the special kind of fat called brown fat that fires up like the... Um, uh, like the stovetop of a gas cooking range, you know? So think about it. You're going to heat, cook some soup. You're going to heat up some soup. You go to your kitchen, you go, you turn a knob, click, 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 whoosh. And that, that, and that's what you, what brown fat in our body actually does. It actually is a fat that we can activate with cold temperatures, like the cold plunges, that's how they work. But foods can actually activate it as well. And when we activate our brown fat, click, 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 whoosh, the flame, the heat that it generates, which is called thermogenesis, has to draw down energy from someplace. Well, it's fuel, right? Like on your kitchen, you got to draw gas, you know, from uh, from the street, from the town, or from a tank by the side of your house. Where does the brown fat get that energy from? It steals the energy from white fat, from visceral fat, from harmful fat. So here's an opportunity to activate brown fat, good fat, that's your hero, to burn down and draw fuel from the harmful visceral white fat. Fat fights fat by eating food is a really cool concept that you, you know, you don't have to restrict yourself. You can actually lean into food. So what are some of these foods? Well, you mentioned some of them already that, you know, like in the tropics, you know, you can actually have um, all kinds of fruits. Watermelon's a good one. Um, but also in the produce section, tomatoes, citrus, avocados, kiwi, uh, you know, uh, lots of leafy greens, uh, broccoli, but not just regular broccoli, broccoli rob. Um, bok choy, um, uh, undive, they all can actually do this amazing activation of the brown fat. You go to the middle aisle, what can you get? Papers, olives, olive oil, you know, dried chili flakes, all kinds of dried mushrooms, all kinds of great things in there. And the reason I'm kind of taking you through my writer's journey for the reader is I wanted to make it really practical to say, look, you can eat metabolism acting food without spending a ton of money. 
This is not about, you know, hoity-toity food. This is about stuff you can get in the grocery store. You can put into your cart from almost any section, okay? I tell people to, you know, take a photograph of the lists, um, and I also include the doses uh, uh, for where they're known, and take it shopping with you. But the other reason is that what do you do with all these individual food ingredients? Well, for me, my approach to putting together ingredients, I love um, Mediterranean food. So Italian, Spanish, uh, Southern France, Spanish, Greek food. As I mean, there's a, there's more than 20 Mediterranean countries. They all have amazing recipes. Israel's on you know, the Mediterranean. I also like Asian food. So Japanese, Chinese, Vietnamese, Thai, um, uh, you know, there, and there's a lot of Asian countries as well. These countries, these areas, Asia and the Mediterranean, have the um, most revered and to me tastiest culinary food traditions, food cultures in, in human history. I mean, who doesn't like to go to a, Medi a restaurant that serves Mediterranean food and find something that they just love, right? Or go to an Asian restaurant and you can find something that you really, really love. And so to me, I call it, Medi you know, people ask me, Dr. Lee, what diet are you on? And I said, no diet. I don't do diets. And they're like, well, so how do you eat? And I said, well, that's a great question because I have a way of eating, an approach. I call it Mediterranean. It's not fusion, although it could be. I, rather, what I do is I automatically, when I'm at the grocery store, when I'm planning a menu, when I go to a buffet or go to a restaurant, open a menu, I'm actually looking at things that I recognize that either fall into Mediterranean genre or Asian genre. I'll naturally go there because those recipes tend to actually use ingredients that activate my metabolism, help me uh, fight harmful body fat, and also activate my health defenses. So that's really my approach. I have got recipes that come out of my own kitchen, by the way, um, in my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, and also kind of meal plan. The meal plan is not a, it's not a codex. It's not a, um, it's, it's not a rule book. It's a guide because everyone's journey is their own. Everyone has the favorite things they like, things that they don't like, and that's completely fine. Yeah, no, that's so great. And for me, I, I also consider myself a foodie. And and even from the time I was a kid, my parents, my friends' parents, they always described me as a good eater. And I love tasty cuisine. And I've taken several trips over my lifetime to the Mediterranean, Italy, Portugal, all these places. And my favorite thing is to do exactly what Dr. Lee says, go to their market, see what they eat, go to their local restaurants. I mean, I literally just light up when you serve me a plate of home cooked food from wherever it is in the world, right. you know, and it's, it's one of my favorite things to do. And so I appreciate that you share that because a lot of people they have, you know, as well as with the fat that we talked about at the beginning, we have this negative connotation Oh, fat is the enemy fat is bad. Well, actually fat is our friend and it does a lot of cool stuff. Food should be our friend too. And we should enjoy it. We should literally, I mean, for me, it's one of the highlights of each and every day of what I'm going to eat. I love to eat and I love to eat. You mentioned in the book and, and we get, didn't get into this, but I just wanted to share that the, the people you eat with, you know, how you prepare it and all of the things that go into the meal. And I think the Mediterraneans, I, I know them more so because I haven't been to Asia, but um, other than a couple of trips to Bali and things, but um, the, the people there, food is a big part of their day, right? They sit, they gather, they prepare together, they hang out and, you know, they have two, three, four, five courses and it's a whole experience. And, and, and when they, and, and in these food cultures, when they get together to eat, you know, they're not talking about their troubles. They're not talking yeah. about their work. They're not, you know what they're talking about? They're talking about the food that they're eating yeah. They're That's part of mindful eating is actually to know and appreciate what they're eating. Like if you go to, if you go to some of these Mediterranean countries and you sit down with friends and family and they serve the food, which is the local traditions, people are talking about the food. They're talking about how their mom makes it. They're talking about the last time they had it and how they prepared themselves. It really is a completely different experience. And by the way, you know, lest anybody feel like, you know, that, oh, this is Dr. Hemingway and Dr. Lee. They, you know, they're able to travel and, and uh, listen, these days go to the simplest grocery store to pick up one of these metabolism activating foods. And if you don't know how to actually work with it, if you don't know how to do it, um, uh, here's what you do. Take any ingredient that you want to explore, type in, go to Google, type it in, put, type in that ingredient, and then type in Mediterranean, okay, or Asian, and then type in recipe and video. 
Okay. Hit the video. And this is anybody who has, if you have a mobile phone that can get on the internet, this is, that's all you need. Click a video and you can watch somebody teach you how to cook it with a video in their own kitchen with passion and authority and make it easy for you. And so this is why we don't really need to be global trekkers uh, anymore to be able to uh, enjoy this. Now, if you can go, I mean, please don't go to an American restaurant when you're traveling around. <laughs> uh, like, just like, you know, be be one with wherever you're, you're at. But when you're home, you know, wherever home base is, okay, please also just recognize that there is a world of ingredients out there and an even bigger world of traditions of how to prepare them. It is time to get past and go put into the past this idea of food is something we need to fear. We need to rediscover the joy of eating and align that with our joy of health. Yeah, that's no, so important. And it just gets me excited because it's so easy now. We all have these, you know, almost all of us have some kind of an internet connection, whether it be on our phone or desktop, whatever it is, we can, we can literally go and grab one thing. That's what I actually share with my patients and those I'm working with is just choose one thing to add every week. Like one thing, we can all do one thing and then figure out, like Dr. Lee says, just go to Google and see what a recipe is in a video and you can figure out how to use this thing. Like for me in Hawaii, the first time, you know, I moved there 30 years ago, everybody was eating um, this thing called bok choy. And if you don't know what that is, just Google it. There's all kinds of really interesting ways to prepare it. And I'd never had it before. I grew up in California, mostly ate Mexican food and, and just whatever my mom prepared, but I'd never tried bok choy and I had no idea what to do with it. And I had a couple of people show me, here's how you prepare it, you know, and maybe another week it was something with the taro root, which is common in Hawaii. It's kind of like their version of the potato, right? That kind of purple potato. I learned how to prepare that. And if you just take one thing a week, you'd be surprised at how quickly your palate will not only appreciate it, you'll love it, but it, but it's, it's fun. It actually brings the passion into just this thing we call eating, which I think in, in America, Dr. Lee, my, my thing that I see most people, they're just in a rush all the time. It's like, you got to sit down, got to eat, then you got to get on to the next thing. And you're just missing out on this experience, uh, connecting with your food. The, the next thing three times a day should be the, 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 the joy that you actually have. You can take a break. It's not even a break from the normal thing. It's actually something that you know, in many parts of the world is a real pleasure to do. You get enjoyment uh, out of it. So, you know, I do think that um, uh, people are waking up to this idea that it's time to take control of our health. We can't just um, relinquish our health to our health system. I mean, look, you and I are both doctors. And so we're trained to be on that end, you know, the healthcare delivery part of things. But, you know, isn't it ironic that it takes doctors to actually you know, turn around and cross that line to say, hey, you know what? Use the hospital if you need to. Use a doctor if you need to. But honestly, the health care you do is between doctor's visits. You yeah. know, like you'd want to do this all by yourself and you are the world's expert on your own body. Yeah, no, put the power back into each and every one of us. And I think that's the beauty of your new book is you just give us all these ideas. You keep it real simple. You know, I love the journey in the grocery store. Like I you know, like most people will tell people, oh, you don't want to spend a lot of time in the middle aisles, but there's some there's some gold in there. You know, like I said, the the chili pepper flakes and the olives and, and the spices and there there's actually some pretty cool stuff in there. And even the seafood aisle that a lot of people love to hate. And I take your your approach. I love seafood, but the reason why is I know how to prepare it and I know how to eat it when it's well prepared. People that have never had it prepared well. Oh, it's too fishy. It's too this. It's no. It's there's so much, you know, gold in there. And so I, I love the new book. It's so practical. It's so simple. It really helps us to understand better the importance of fat and our metabolism, how to get it to really work for us. And so I, I, I just want to give you a few moments. I'm, you know, want to be respectful of your time with us, but share with us any kind of parting thoughts. Um, and just how we can get your book and, and reach out to you and become a part of your amazing community. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I'm a researcher. So I'm said every day when I roll out of bed, I'm actually uh, sitting in front of a fire hydrant of new research information coming at me on food and health. And so I do a lot of heavy lifting, which is to sort through all the information, 
see what is um, worthwhile, which one is actually important, what is news you can use. And so I put that out, like part of my mission is to get that information out to people. Uh, even between the books that I actually write, um, I have a newsletter. And so it's a free newsletter. So if you're interested in hearing of what's going on and little practical fun tips on things that can make a big difference uh, and taste great at the same time, come to my website. It's uh, uh, www.drwilliamlee.com, drwilliamlee.com, or follow me uh, on social media. My handle is at Dr. Dr. William Lee, L-I. And by the way, for people who really are interested in hearing a little bit more in detail, I do these free master classes every now and then. You can sign up for my website. Um, and then people that really want to do a deep dive, they're like, if you're like, okay, it's time for me to actually get serious about this. I do teach online courses. I do one on metabolism. I do one on health defenses. They're a lot of fun to do. Um, everyone has got the right time. And I've had thousands of people take these courses from I think 23 countries, um, so around the world. So, you know, this just goes to show you that there's a there's sort of a big wake up call of that I think is going on all around us um, to say, you know, I think we can actually thrive uh, and feel better and eat better all at the same time without having to deprive ourselves. And that's really what I want to leave people with. You can love your food to love your health. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Such, such an important message. Food is so powerful and it should be enjoyed. I think that's one of those primordial things that, that we as humans, we want to be able to have a relationship that's healthy and that's just really enjoyable. I know it's one of my favorite things to do. And I'm so, uh, just so grateful that you came on to share your passion with us and, and also the ease and simplicity that it, it doesn't have to be hard. You know, it's, it's not strict. It's not rigid. And even in your book, you detail out, you know, maybe just here's the list of kind of do a little bit less of this. And then here's the bigger list of all the things to add. And so thank you for, for doing that. And thank you for being here with us today. Really, really appreciate you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for watching. And remember to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell so you never miss out. Aloha.